afternoon and thank you for joining us for the Grace Buddhist Academy tonight. But I may mental health series to in partnership with Student Support and Wellness. Tonight's session is going to be presented by Ms. Emma Snyder with NAMI and Search for Virginia. Tonight's session for Indigenous Balance, a workshop for families. Um, it's going to be a pretty heavy content um, and maybe for some of you all. So we do ask that if you need a moment um, during the session, then just take a moment, um, take a deep breath, step away, or if you're watching the recording, to pause and come back. Um, as well as um, rely on supports that you may need throughout the session. So with that being said, I'll be happy to turn it over to Ms. Emma Snyder. Hi, everyone. Um, like you mentioned, I am Emma Snyder. I'm with the National Alliance on Mental Illness in Central Virginia. I'm going to be presenting Ending the Silence Today, which is a workshop, of, a suicide prevention education workshop for families and caregivers of loved ones and of children. So, like I mentioned, my name is Emma Snyder. I'm the Program and Outreach Manager. I've been here for a little over eight months now, so I'm still rather new to my position. Um, but I did graduate fairly recently, um, which is the reason for that. So I graduated in May of 2021 from the University of Mary Washington um, with a double major in psychology, uh, specifically developmental psychology, and a, another major in English and creative writing. I'm an overachiever um, and a minor, actually, too, in digital studies. So um, I have a lot of educational experience experience in these subjects, but also um, practical experience. I've worked with Virginia Victim Assistance Network, Mental Health America, and also um, I, I am a crisis counselor for Crisis Text Line, which we will mention uh, in this presentation as well. It's an incredible resource. Um, and I've also been a child care provider for almost 10 years now, over 10 years. Um, I am not a parent, but I do have a lot of experience working with parents and with families and with children um, throughout the lifespan from literally newborns um, up into the high school age that we're going to be talking about today. I want to also just mention that more importantly than any of that, I am somebody who lives with mental health conditions, and that's really important to our mission here at NAMI. All of our staff and all of our volunteers are people who have either a mental illness themselves or a loved one with a mental illness, so it's very close to them. They have that intimate personal experience. With that also being said, I want to preface by saying we are not medical professionals here at NAMI. Uh, we don't want you to come away from this presentation trying to diagnose your child or yourself with a mental health condition. Instead, we're hoping to help you learn from what we know as an organization, what I know through what I've personally been through, and to give you the knowledge to know the warning signs of suicide risk and poor mental health in your child and what to do and how to reach out and respond if that's the case. Mental health is something that I hope most of us have heard of, um, especially with so much effort and to bring awareness to it and destigmatize it in the media today. Um, and I'm sure many of you have also heard the adage that physical health is as important as mental health. A lot of us really focus on our physical health. We, you know, hopefully go to the doctor for annual checkups and take care of all sorts of things. Uh, but when it comes to mental health, we don't always have the same focus and the same drive to take care of it. Uh, but mental health can affect a lot of parts of our life. Um, ironically, it does impact physical health from our blood pressure and metabolism levels to headaches and joint pain as well. It impacts our ability to learn, which is very, very relevant when we're talking about children. Um, our focus, concentration, and memory are all impacted. Also relationships, so that would be family relationships, friendships, romantic relationships, all of those are impacted um, by the ability to maintain it and create it and nourish it. That's much, much easier to do when we're in a state of good mental health. Development is also something that's very strongly impacted. We're going to talk about that a lot later on, uh, but it's very important to encourage positive mental health to affect positive development. Attendance is something that we see um, typically people with mental health or with like poor mental health or poor mental health conditions. We all have mental health. We don't all have mental health conditions, which I will also talk about. Um, attendance is something that a lot of people struggle with. So whether that be in the workplace, socially, or also academically at school, that can be something we see. Um, and it also impacts traditional success. Success really does look different for everyone, but our stereotypical ideas of what that looks like in here in America um, can really be impacted by the quality of your mental health. Because it has such a wide impact, it's really important that we learn how to help our children maintain their own mental health and maintain ours at the same time. And we're gonna be talking about a lot of strategies on how to do that today. So like I promised, we are going to be talking about the difference between mental health and mental illness. There is a big difference between them because mental health is something that all of us have. It is just the word that we use to describe our mental and emotional well-being. Every single person on this planet has mental health. Um, again, it's as 
as important as physical health, um, even though a lot of stigma, um, a lot of issues with that, which we'll talk about as well today, um, really do impact the way we talk about mental health and the way we actually treat our mental health. Um, and having poor mental health um, does not mean you have a mental illness necessarily. They're not equated. They're not the same thing. Mental illness, on the other hand, is a difference in brain chemistry. There are a variety of mental illnesses, um, which we also might call a mental health disorder or a mental health condition um, that have different symptoms people experience in the day to day. They definitely go above and beyond what we would consider just a bad mental health day because they can impact a person's life in every way. Now, mental illnesses are complicated. There is no one cause or gene that we can look at as the reason for someone having one. Mental illnesses can be genetic, um, and it's, but different ones are inherited at different rates, with some being more genetic than other ones. And that's because genes don't equal our destiny, especially when it comes to mental health and mental illness. Epigenetics is what is going to play a very major factor in the development um, of specifically mental illnesses, but in many, many things in our life. Some genes in our DNA are expressed, others are not. When we say a gene's expressed, that's just what it sounds like. And with mental illness, what often happens um, when that with the development of mental illness, which we often also see around puberty, um, is that we have a genes that are not active, that are just kind of in our DNA, living there, chilling there. Uh, they are acted by um, something in our environment. So a lot of times that can be the hormones that are encouraged through puberty. So um, a lot of young teens and, and kind of young tweens um, are going to be experiencing mental health symptoms for the first time if they didn't before, and that was already part of their experience, and that was going to be something that happened. The puberty acts on that, um, and that leads to that gene expression, almost unlocks, in, for lack of a better word, um, to begin the symptoms of what we would consider a mental illness or a mental health condition. Now, one of the things that can help us protect against poor mental health and the development of certain mental health conditions are protective factors. It's important to note that even though, like we just mentioned, genes do not equal destiny, you can introduce every single one of the protective factors we talk about today into your child's life, and it is not a guarantee that they just won't develop a mental health condition. Um, sometimes, despite our best efforts, it's still going to happen, which I'll talk about when I tell my story. That being said, this does not by any means indicate that protective factors are not important. Protective factors, on the other hand, are actually incredibly important. Um, they have a massive impact. So we've seen throughout all the research that has been done in the field of psychology that protective factors can raise rates of resiliency, lower risk of developing both mental and physical illnesses, and reduce the impact of risk factors, which are the opposite of a protective factor. Now, I'm going to lead you through some of the protective factors you can bring into your child's life, which if you're here with us in person or if you're in the chat um, or possibly later as well online, um, we'll be able to link these to you. We have a set of handouts today and one of them is the protective bingo handout. And so this is not an exhaustive list, obviously, of the protective factors that are out there, but it's a really good start. Um, and definitely don't feel like as a parent that you need to do every single thing on this list to help your child build resiliency. We are playing for bingo. It's okay if you don't black out the whole board. The more protective factors you're able to bring into their life, the better chances you're giving them. And we all have to start somewhere. So one of the very first protective factors is providing a warm parent-child relationship. Another is having help and support from family and friends. And some of these, like this one specifically, are things that you can always control. We can't always control if we have supportive and, and healthy and helpful people in our lives. Um, but again, that's protective factors. It can really vary. Showing parental love in a way that they value it. This is on one of our handouts on love languages. I'm sure everybody knows the five love languages. It really blew up <laughs> in the last few years and everybody talks about it, but there are five really incredible distinct love languages and everybody receives and gives love in different ways. If you figure out um, what love language your child is most um, gravitating toward or which couple of them, we do have a handout, kind of a little fact sheet that runs you through some examples of kinds of physical touch or kinds of gift giving or kinds of words of affirmation that could really, really help you develop, again, that warm parent-child relationship, but also show that parental love in a valuable way. Encouraging positive self-esteem, it seems like a grab, but that is very true. It's important um, to help them develop that. 
teaching them how to build good coping skills. That's another one of our handouts as well. Um, it can be hard as adults to cope with our own lives, um, especially as parents. And so modeling is a really big part of that as well. But we do have some examples of great coping skills you can introduce into your child's life and model with them to help them develop these. Celebrating their interest in school and learning helping them develop positive peer relationships. Again, I'm going to keep coming back to it, but modeling it for your children by having positive peer relationships of your own. It's just incredibly important. Showing them how to articulate their feelings by doing that yourself. Creating appropriate, consistent boundaries and discipline. Um, I know from nannying that I've seen a lot of inconsistent discipline. Um, a lot of times parents aren't always on the same page. Maybe you haven't had time to communicate about what kind of discipline you want or what discipline you need. Um, a lot of times parents will come in and you know lay down a consequence and the other parent comes and undoes that. Um, it's really important to have consistent boundaries and discipline with your children to help further this protective factor. Avoid as much as you can, again, not always preventive, um, but avoid exposing them to prolonged stress if you can help it. Listen to them and value their thoughts and feelings. It's free. Um, you don't have to, you know, it's hard sometimes. It can be easy not to take them seriously, especially as they get into teenage years. I have a 16-year-old sister. I've been there. I know it. It's a struggle. Um, but it's important to listen to them and to value their thoughts and feelings because they're people too. And intervene early when you notice warning signs, which is one of the biggest things we're going to be talking about today. We're going to go through the four steps of reaching out, intervening, and how to respond. Building these protective factors takes a lot of time and effort. It isn't something you can kind of just do in one day and, and be done with. It's something that you have to continuously gravitate back toward and work on. Um, if you're standing there and you're watching this, um, it's, this is a great time to ask yourself the question, which protective factor on the previous slide or in the handout um, are you really working on with your child right now? And what is one that you're struggling with? It's a great thing to bring your partner uh, or to your child themselves and just be honest with them. Like, here's something I'm trying really hard to implement how can we work together? Now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, mental health and mental illness is a growing issue for youth today, um, and including with COVID has just been so much more exacerbated. I'm going to share some of the most recent data that we have about mental health conditions and treatment in both children and teens. 17%, so that's almost one in five of children between one and six have a mental or behavioral health condition. When we look at individuals from 12 to 17, so again, we've gone up in age, that percentage jumps up as well. So 27% of youth between 12 and 17 have that same mental or behavioral health condition. Importantly, um, this is one of the most important things um, from this whole slide is that 50%, so that's half of all lifetime cases of mental illness start before the age of 14. So again, that goes back to epigenetics that we were talking about, that goes back to puberty and the hormones and how all of that is happening and impacting our genes um, in our environment. Um, and so most mental illnesses um, really will begin around that age. Twice as many high schoolers with depression are going to drop out versus their peers. Um, so we see just a much, much more exaggerated level of dropouts and low attendance um, and just overall um, non-completion of school uh, for those who have depression, but also mental illness in general can be very impactful in that regard. 17% okay. of high school students yeah. actively consider suicide every year, which is How's a very, Auntie Maria? And, and very large number, um, just because it's not 100%, you know, 17%, like these are people's kids, this is a big number. Uh, and 50% of children between 5 and 18 How are, are you not today? receiving the treatment uh, that they need okay. for their mental health conditions, whether that's because their parents aren't recognizing mental health warning signs, uh, the child hasn't expressed these to their parents, maybe they're having issues with their yeah. children and their insurance coverage, or they don't know what resources are available in their school or their community. How are you today? There's How a million are you and one reasons why this is the hey, case, um, but part of our hope today is that you'll understand a little bit more about how to help your child get the treatment that they need, make this number a little bit lower. There are many, many types of mental health conditions that children, youth, and adults experience throughout their lifetimes. These include, but most definitely are not limited to, depressive disorders. Um, this includes major depressive disorder, which is what a lot of us picture when we think of depression, persistent depressive disorder, postpartum depression, and more. Eating disorders, so this would include anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder, which the last of which is the most common um, in all of America. 
personality disorders. So that would include things like antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder. These don't always show up in young teens, um, but it's something that is often founded in childhood trauma. So something to keep an eye on. Anxiety disorders, the most common uh, mental illness, includes generalized anxiety disorders, specific phobias, agoraphobia, social anxiety, um, just a lot kind of all encompassing in that category. Psychotic disorders, which do tend to be more rare, um, but, but with both psychotic disorders, bipolar and personality, um, we tend to see one in 20 have that, those kind of mental illness. So it's not as uncommon as maybe we're typically used to thinking. And then bipolar disorders as well. So that would include bipolar type one and bipolar type two. Now there are almost 300 different mental health conditions that we know about today. So this list does not even begin to encompass that. We are not going to dive into each disorder and their symptoms today uh, because the goal of this presentation isn't for you to walk away trying to diagnose your child with one of them. Instead, the takeaway here is to really understand that there are many, many kinds of mental illness. Um, they present in many different ways and it's always important to get a professional's opinion, um, but also to take your child seriously when they begin to displaying warning signs of a poor mental health, because even if it's something you're not accustomed to seeing, maybe it doesn't present like the typical anxiety or depression, there could absolutely be something else going on beneath the surface. Now, besides building protective factors into your child's development, another incredibly important piece of helping your child through a mental health issue is early intervention. Time and time again, we have seen across the board in all kinds of areas that the earlier you intervene and get help for your child's mental health, the better the outcome will be for them. That being said, there are four steps to early intervention, which we will be going through one by one today. Step one is to know the warning signs. Step two is to reach out and respond. Step three is to work with school staff and step four is to provide resources and support. The first step is to really know those warning signs. And again, they don't always present in the way that we're used to seeing. You know your child, you have a gut instinct on this kind of thing, uh, but these are some of the most common warning signs that we're going to be talking about today. Before that, though, when we observe a warning sign, it's important to really factor in three main things. And this is because you're going to want to bring this to the school, to your child's doctor, to a professional. You're going to want to keep these three things in mind before you go running, you know, to anybody for, for serious help and intervention. The first is intensity. So how severe and intense are the symptoms your child is experiencing? The second is duration. How long are they lasting? We typically see mental illness um, when we diagnose with somebody with one, it's lasting for two or more weeks. So if it's only been a day or two, you know, it's time to kind of take a second and keep an eye on it, but not necessarily something to really, really be concerned about. And then distress levels. So how much are the symptoms and the warning signs that your child is experiencing really impairing their life and functioning? Is it impacting their school grades? Is it impacting their attendance? Um, things like that. When you observe a warning sign, which we're going to talk about um, in just a second, keep these three things in mind. Um, it helps when you go to a professional, when you go to whoever you're going to for help, um, to make your observations that you're bringing to them more accurate and appropriate for your child's situation and help them get the treatment they need faster. Another important thing to factor in is whether your child's behavior is typical or atypical. This is obviously something that's going to look different in every family and in every child, but there are some similarities across the board. If you get the gut feeling again or that instinct that something's off, um, even if everything else seems typical, do trust yourself, involve the professionals, but um, there are just some behaviors that are very typical, especially as we get into high school um, and we see a lot of the things happening with high schoolers. Um, some of it's just normal. Some of it's normal puberty and growing up. So. Um, that's also going to be something we practice today. With younger children specifically, so this is going to be children um, under the age of like 11 or 12, some warning signs we typically see um, both at home and school, sometimes only in one place over the other. There are some um, conditions that only express and, and exhibit in one, um, but if your child is having frequent tantrums or intensely irritable the majority of the time, um, keep an eye on that. Often talking about fears, worries, or nightmares. Complaining about frequent headaches, stomach aches with no medical cause or reason, in constant motion, can't sit still quietly, except when using screens. If they can sit and be glued to cocomelon, they're probably fine. Like, you, you know, that's, it's important to know, that, like, if they're in constant motion, other than that, that is something to keep an eye on. Most children can sit very, very still and quiet when on a screen. Sleeping too much or too little, seems sleepy throughout the day. 
are not interested in playing with their children or have difficulty making friends, which obviously is something that also can be complicated as we move out of COVID and out of um, what the pandemic has done to a lot of younger children. Struggling academically or experiencing a recent decline in progress. Repeating actions or checking things many times out of fear that something bad might be happening and talking about wanting to hurt themselves or hurt others, which is, you know, sometimes little kids, they say things to get a reaction out of you, um, but it's still something to keep an eye on. With older children, so again, kind of the tweens and, and teens, um, that we, do, we do see behavior be a little more divided. So we do divide it by at home and at school. So with home, we see um, as warning signs when a child starts to really seem sad, hopeless, and empty. They might have unhealthy sleeping patterns. Um, they might just go to bed right after school and, you know, not get up until the next morning. Or maybe they stay up all night. You know, these are things to keep an eye on. Lying, making up stories. Um, often for no reason, highly reactive to rejection and criticism, having very, very low self-worth or self-hatred, unexpectedly rude or snappy, kind of out of the ordinary, staying isolated and not participating, talking or joking about dying. We hear a lot of um, kids joke, um, including my 16-year-old sister, about dying, um, but a lot of times that is something to really take seriously, and the joking is more of a coping mechanism in that regard, uh, and subtle or overt signs of self-harm. At school, we see the same kind of warning signs translate a little differently. So your child might be missing or skipping classes altogether quite frequently. Their quality of work may decline. They could miss assignments, tests, and exams. They could be extremely disorganized or kind of on the flip side showing patterns of perfectionism. They might also respond very emotionally to grades. They might have trouble focusing or paying attention expressing thoughts of violence and hate, or making up excuses not to participate in the social activities. Now we're going to go through the concept of typical versus atypical, which we already touched on briefly. We're going to talk about a couple situations, and at the end of them, keep in mind intensity, duration, and distress level, and try thinking to yourself which one, you know, is this typical? Is this something that is probably just part of the development, or is this more atypical? Is this something to keep an eye on um, for the future and maybe go to somebody about? So in this specific situation, Naomi, who is six, has been complaining of her stomach aching. She's always been a picky eater, but now she's barely eating enough. This has only been going on for about a week ever since you came back from a close family funeral. So is this normal behavior, very typical, or could Naomi possibly be dealing with symptoms of a mental health condition or poor mental health? We would think of this as honestly pretty typical behavior. It's very, very normal for children to be affected by grief. They often exhibit this in different ways. Um, she's six. She's just gotten back from a funeral. So her version of grief is going to look a lot different from the way that we experience it. It's also only been about a week since these behaviors have started. Knowing that it's probably grief related, she might just need that extra comfort, consolation, and understanding. Um, but obviously, if it goes on a little too long from that, we would want to kind of consider that a warning sign and see what help we could give to her. Logan has been picking fights at school for the last six months. He's eight. You thought it was a phase, but now he started talking back to the teachers and has been disobedient during class, and his grades are suffering as a result. In this case, we would actually be considering this more atypical behavior. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize there were people online. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, so we're just going through atypical versus typical and voting on whichever one. So we're going to start um, with duration here for Logan. This has been happening for six months, and it's negatively impacting his school performance and also potentially his peer relationships. So that's definitely a warning sign to keep in consideration. Uh, and behavioral and mental health conditions can often go hand in hand. It really is worth kind of talking to a professional to see what's going on in this circumstance. Kate, who is 11, has been avoiding her friends and saying she can't participate in social get-togethers, which has been going on for months now. She's spending more time in her room and keeps saying that she's fine. Now, do we think this is more typical behavior for an 11-year-old girl, or is this something that's a little more atypical? 
In this case, this would be something that is atypical. Kate is experiencing a significant level of distress. It has enough intensity to isolate her from everyone, even those who are close to her. And she's been dealing with these symptoms for several, several months now. So it's not something that's just one off. It's not a phase. Um, and it's also important to note here that 11, 12, and 13, again, are those ages where a lot of mental health conditions begin to develop with Kate being 11, really, really something to keep an eye on. Now, we're moving up in age, um, if you didn't notice, so now we're at 14, right? So we've gone from kind of these younger kids, and now we're in the teenage years. So Ben, who's 14, becomes argumentative and disrespectful to his parents and his teachers when preparing for finals in this last month, which leads to him losing privileges that are important to him. Do we think this is pretty normal, typical behavior for a 14-year-old boy in his final season, or is this something to keep an eye on? Pretty typical. Uh, feeling extra stressed around a stressful time is very normal. Uh, it's acting out in response to that as a 14 year old. Um, even as adults, we don't always act to stress and respond to it in the way that we wish we did, um, especially when you're 14 and you don't always have the coping skills to handle that. And the duration, intensity, and distress levels are all centered around the one temporary event, which are his finals. Um, so in this case, even though it has been going on for a month, that's a little tricky. Uh, but if his finals have been kind of stretched throughout the month or, you know, kind of intermixed, uh, that is something that could continue to stress him out for that long. Audrey. Audrey is also 14. Her grades and her class attendance have stayed the same, but she started to change a lot of her opinions on topics that you used to agree on, and she's found a different fun group. Is this normal behavior, or is Audrey potentially dealing with a mental health issue? Typical teens and young adults for that matter. I explore all different kinds of styles and opinions and in more uh, while they figure out who they are and who they want to be. That is very developmentally normal at her age. And also finding a new friend group is normal. We fall in and out of friendships ourselves throughout our lives. Um, and the biggest, biggest key here to this being very typical behavior is her performance at school and her relationships. These aren't suffering as a result um, of her behavior. James, 15, has been wearing long pants and long sleeve shirts all summer long, complaining that he's cold. You've noticed during stressful situations, he disappears into his room for a little while and then returns feeling calmer. Is this normal behavior or could James be dealing with mental health issue? No, uh, you know, wearing long pants and sleeves in the warm weather, it could be a sign of self-harm um, or at the very least low self-esteem. I personally don't even own a pair of shorts, so I don't know what that tells you about me, but just very low self-esteem. Um, and that clearly could be the same for James. Maybe it's not as serious as self-harm, uh, but something to keep an eye on either way. The duration is also important here. This is something that's happening all summer. So it's not just a one-time occurrence. It's not just he wore long pants and long sleeves one day out of the whole summer. This is every day and the distress level. So obviously this is something that can really impact his ability to participate in outdoor activities or maybe his friends are making fun of him, that kind of thing. And disappearing into his room and returning calmer can be typical for teens who often need space to decompress just like the rest of us. Um, but it could also be a sign they're self-harming, especially when we pair it um, with the other warning sign that we're seeing. Lastly, we have Anna. So Anna is 16. She experiences a wide range of emotions throughout the course of a whole day, from sad to angry to happy. When you ask her what's going on, she says there's nothing, but she's open to figuring it out with you. Do we think this is typical or more atypical behavior. Typical, so mood swings and hormones are best friends. They go hand in hand. It is easy to look at symptoms of bipolar disorder, which again is why we did not talk about all the different conditions today um, and kind of connect the two. But mental health conditions like bipolar disorder and other mood disorders have mood swings that are really going above and beyond these normal situational hormonal up and downs. It's also important to note duration. Her behavior has only lasted for a week. So it's not a long enough time to be considered a mental health condition at this point versus something that you can keep an eye on and offer for her support for. The takeaway from all of that is that some things are just a normal part of life and the child growing up experience, um, but it can be really hard to tell the difference. If you're worried, um, you know your child best, talk to their school, talk to the professional, reach out for help and those resources, um, because it's always better to be safe, you know, if you, if you really are concerned. Earlier, we went through some of the data on mental health and youth, and now we're going to take some time to talk about suicide, which is obviously a very, very heavy topic um, and kind of how it's been impacting our youth today.
Suicide is the second leading cause of death in youth from ages 15 to 24, with the first being accidents. So, you know, we hear about accidents a lot in the news. The suicide is going to be right under that, and it's 15 to 24. So that's a, both encompasses college, but also high school as well. Twice as many girls versus boys experience suicidal ideation, which is what we consider, again, that talking and joking about dying, having obsessive thoughts about it, um, those kind of things. But in comparison, four times as many boys versus girls are actually the ones who complete suicide. 19%, almost 20% of teens seriously consider suicide in 2019 versus 20 or to 2020. Um, and this is really important to note that percentage is a lot higher, um, not only in females at, at 24%, but for those in the LGBTQ community, that's almost 50%. Um, so it's a very, very large um, sobering number. 9% of teens actually attempted suicide in these same years. That percentage was again, higher for females at 11%, higher for black teens at 12%. And for those in the LGBTQ community, again, really soaring above that at 23%. Why is this important to go through? Because these are not just numbers. These are children and their lives, and it's a big deal. Our part in this is to educate you and yours as parents is to observe. There are often, though not always, warning signs for suicide risk, and it's important to know them and to understand how to approach your child if you notice one. So we're going to talk through two things here. We're going to talk about risk factors, but we're also going to talk about the warning signs. Risk factors, again, are things that can be lessened with your protective factors that you're implementing, but these are things that we typically see leading someone to have a more likely chance to develop a mental health condition or suicide risk. Having symptoms of a mental health condition specifically, um, this is really important. Um, if your child is struggling with depression, bipolar disorder, or substance use disorder, that goes a lot higher in the risk factor. Also previous suicide attempts, a family history of depression and suicide, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, lack of a support network, and as we've just seen, struggling with gender identity or sexual identity and with a lack of support. The warning signs are typically um, talking about suicide or death, um, also jokingly, as we mentioned earlier. Um, sometimes that can come more subtly, so someone just talking about not wanting to be around anymore or being a burden. Talking about feeling hopeless or guilty is another way they might express that bigger feeling. Pulling away from friends and family. Writing songs, poems, letters, and stories about death, loss, and suicide. Losing interest in things that they used to love giving away treasured possessions. That might also include pets a lot of the time we've seen and engaging in risk-taking behaviors. Now, whether you notice a warning sign of a mental health condition or a warning sign of suicide risk, as a parent, the best thing you can do and the first thing you should do is to reach out and respond. So we're gonna walk through both how to respond in a life-threatening mental health crisis, but also in a non-life-threatening one because they have some pretty important distinctions. In the case of a life-threatening mental health crisis, so you've asked directly to your child, are you considering suicide? And they've said yes, or you believe, even if they've said no, that they are. Um, this is important also just to note really quickly, um, a lot of times people feel uncomfortable asking that question. I get it as a crisis counselor, I have to ask that in every single conversation um, because it's it does not lead them to carry out suicide like this is something that's been researched time and time again because people are like worried you know if you think like am i if i'm gonna ask my child this like they're gonna think that i just gave them permission or some kind of uncomfortable thing there um, but that is not the case what we actually see the majority of the time is that saying um, are you considering suicide just gives them the chance to share that with you it gives them the chance to know that you're listening and that you're here and you're with them in this space if your child has said this, or again, if you believe that this could be the case, do not leave them by themselves. Um, even for a second, if they try to say they need to go to the bathroom, they need to go get their phone, like go with them. Like do not let them be alone in this moment. Um, keep harmful things out of their reach to the best of your ability. Um, and call 911 if you need an emergency immediate response. But if you have maybe a little more time and you feel like maybe this isn't quite, it's life-threatening for sure, but you think maybe the 988 number, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline could be of help Help, they can help kind of talk you through the situation. They're trained mental health professionals. They do dispatch emergency services if necessary, so they can be a really great contact in a life-threatening mental health crisis. In terms of a non-life-threatening mental health crisis, so you've noticed a sign of poor mental health or potentially a warning condition um, or warning sign, but not necessarily something that is an active suicide risk, there are three kind of starter steps. 
The first is expressing concern. So saying, you know, I've noticed that you've been missing a lot of school lately, or you seem really down and disconnected when I try to talk to you, or lately you've been super distant from the family. I'm worried something's going on. Offer them support. Tell them you want to help. You're here to listen. Don't promise to keep it a secret. I know I told my mom all the time, don't tell dad, you know, I'm going to keep it a secret, but don't, don't promise that. Um, if they get upset with that or uncomfortable with that, tell them that their safety uh, and is the most important thing to them because to you because you love them. Um, and then lastly, seeking out resources. Tell them you will work with them um, to talk to a school counselor, find a local therapist, whatever you can do to support them um, and make sure you also ask what they need from you. A lot of times um, offering suggestions isn't what they really want in that moment, even if it's going to be the eventual outcome, you are going to take them to therapy or do this or that. Really just asking them what they need in that moment can be very, very important. Again, sometimes it can be really uncomfortable to start that situation when you notice a warning sign. Um, so kind of some easy ways to do that um, would be to say something like, tell me more about what you're feeling right now. I'm ready to listen. Now is definitely most not the time to share your stories and your experiences. Give them a safe space. I love my mom, but every time I start talking about my problems, she starts talking about hers. It does not help you in that situation to feel like you're having a safe space for yourself. Saying, can you help me understand? I would love to help you find a solution is a great way to start the conversation. Don't try to fix necessarily the situation. Listen to them and give them options that are suitable, um, but also only if they really want them. Obviously, you might be like already decided like they're going to be in therapy. I'm going to help them find a therapist. Um, but in this immediate conversation, you know, what is the thing that they need the most? And almost most importantly, is there someone else they would feel comfortable talking to? As much as we would like to be our child's confidant, we aren't always. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that they might have a sibling or a friend or someone else who is a safe space for them. And so asking if they need to talk to someone else and making sure they have a quiet and safe space to do so. Um, again, not quite eavesdropping, but not leaving them alone too much either, kind of balancing that so they still feel like, you know, you're trying to keep them safe, but you're also trying to acknowledge that maybe you're not the person they need to talk to about this in this moment. When it comes to school staff, there are four important steps to start the conversation there and getting your child the help they need. The first is finding the point of contact. So you want to find out who your school's mental health point of contact is. A lot of times school counselors are divided by last name. So finding out what your child's school counselor is, who they are, and getting connected with them. Share their your concerns with them. So tell them about the warning sign that you've noticed. Just see if you can talk to your child's teachers and the staff at the school and if they've noticed anything similar or maybe different in the classroom. Ask them about resources. Is, are there any in the community or at the school that maybe you don't know about that you would need to get connected with? And seek accommodations if necessary. Does your student and your child need flexibility, extra time on exams? Um, what's really needed there? How can you make sure that that's implemented going forward for them? With healthcare professionals, whether again, that be a therapist or a pediatrician or someone else, there are again, those kind of four steps to start talking about your child and the warning signs and getting them the help that they need. Starting with sharing, again, your concerns. Um, include those reports with the intensity, duration, and stress levels um, that you've gathered, um, both from school staff, but also from your home. Um, ask them about evaluations. A lot of times professionals like a, a doctor are going to know um, if your child's warning signs are likely to be a mental health condition and they'll do an assessment if need be. Ask them for referrals. Um, a lot of times people's first go-to is their pediatrician. Your pediatrician likely knows a couple of mental health people who are in network with your insurance, um, who are local to you and, and help with children because there is definitely a lack of child therapists out there. So it's, you know, you have somebody, a pediatrician who might know some and educate yourself. So build your confidence um, by learning more about your child's mental health condition if they're diagnosed with one um, or just their warning signs and how to support them so that you can be an advocate for them um, in their mental health journey. School staff are an incredibly valuable asset to your child's mental health journey. Often schools are going to have licensed counselors or social workers on their staff who are in-house professionals when it comes to knowing what's typical or atypical, um, what kind of mental health issues your child might be struggling with, and more. Your child's teachers are also great to work with because as we mentioned previously, they are gonna be spending a great deal of time with your child and might be able to kind of help you fill in some of the blanks when it comes to behavior from your child that you might not be seeing in the classroom. By working together with school staff, you can connect your child to the right resources sooner and make sure that they get the help that they need.
Now, the last step of this early intervention that we've been talking about is to provide resources and support, which is mainly going to consist of building a support network, not only for your child, but for yourself as well. Now, your support network needs to involve three main things. The first is, as we've been talking about a lot today, healthcare providers. So pediatricians, therapists who you trust and your child likes, switch them out if you need to, um, and definitely don't hesitate to find a therapist for yourself. They can be great tools to help you develop further parenting skills, talk through the stresses of responsibility and parenting, and more. School staff, again, mentioned very, very heavily today. Teachers, staff, social workers, and more. Um, get to know the ones who oversee your child at your school and keep them in the loop about changes in your child's life maybe in their environment, behavior you're seeing at home, and lastly, community. So family, friends, faith communities, support groups, these are all things that can be a protective factor in your child's life just by having that support, um, but in yours as well, because as we've mentioned, it's really important to be taking care of your mental health. Being a parent can be really, really tough, um, and having a support network can make you feel a lot less alone. In terms of our organization, NAMI Central Virginia, we can also be a source of support. We offer support groups throughout the month that are completely free. Um, most relevant to this is the Four Parents of Youth Support Group, which meets on the last Thursdays. We also offer mental health courses, so that would be Children's Challenging Behaviors and NAMI Basics, which is a shorter on-demand version available for free on our website that goes through the skills that you can build as a parent to help a child who is living with and dealing with a mental health condition. We also have mental health presentations. So we do this one, obviously for families. We have a very similar one for st school staff and teachers. And then we also have one for students. Um, and again, all of these are completely peer led. They involve somebody sharing their story about mental health and mental illness. Um, and it can be very, very impactful. And then Mental Health 101 is also a great presentation. Um, if you end up wanting to do one in your community, that's a great way to kind of bring awareness to this bigger topic as a whole. We also have a resource booklet, which is available online on our website for the first time this year. So this is very convenient um, for everyone, but it is available online. So the resource booklet, um, again, updated yearly, it has a list of um, like a gajillion resources for mental health, how homeless housing, all kinds of issues, food insecurity, child and youth resources. It's every resource you could think of is in there and they're all updated every year. And then we also have sections. So there's majorly it's for the central Virginia area. That's the majority of them. But we also have um, just for the Tri-Cities area specifically in Dinwiddie County. The peer support and community, lastly, is the really big part of NAMI. Sharing impactful stories can be a way to offer advocacy and awareness, um, which is why I'm going to be doing that today. So I want to just take a few minutes because I know this is a very heavy presentation, um, just to kind of share my story of what it's been like for me to live with a mental illness, some of the warning signs that I saw, um, because again, as somebody who's been through developmental psychology and, and I know a lot about these things, um, even to this day, I don't always recognize the warning signs um, and kind of what it's been like on me for my journey to recovery. So as you guys already know, I'm Emma. Um, I'm young enough that I can tell you guys how old I am. I'm 23. Um, and I'm someone who lives with multiple mental and physical health conditions. I am the oldest of six girls, which is pertinent only to let you know I've been driven crazy my entire life. I have five little sisters, the youngest just turned four. Um, so quite the, a large age range, this 19 year age gap. Um, and I'm going to be sharing, like I just mentioned, my story of what I've been through. Hopefully that it resonates with one of you, that you can recognize some of the protective factors that my parents built in, even though they didn't stop me from developing the conditions that I have, um, but that I've been able to fall back on and rely on my parents regardless um, has been a very, very important thing throughout my life. That being said, I want to start by saying I have an incredible family. I have loving parents, um, a ton of sisters who I debatably get along with, some more than others and at different times. Um, and I actually did grow up homeschooled, so I didn't get bullied. I didn't experience any kind of trauma, not that school gives you trauma, but in my, you know, in, I, didn't, I didn't experience any of that. I didn't have any like peer fallouts. I, I was very, very sheltered, um, which can be a protective factor in a way, but also a disadvantage um, in the real world. Um, and we've talked a lot about protective factors today, and my parents built so many into my life and my sister's lives growing up. That was very, very important to them. Um, again, the homeschool thing, right? And so even though it didn't stop me, um, it helped me share what I needed to share with my parents when I was dealing with mental health issues. 
it all kind of started when I was 12. Um, I began experiencing suicidal ideation, but I didn't know what the name of that was or, or what to call it. All I knew was that I was really obsessing and kind of ruminating on what it would be like if I wasn't here, um, kind of darker kind of thoughts like that, nightmares, things like that. Um, and it began to impact me when I was awake too. I kind of had those feelings of being useless or a burden or worthless, um, which as a 12 year old, right out of nowhere, kind of perfectly happy and neurotypical before then. Um, can be a really hard thing to have out of nowhere and to not know how to cope with. Around the same time, I was doing a lot of obsession and compulsion things. OCD, didn't know what that was, um, but I was feeling very um, scared that something bad would happen to my family, who I love dearly and who was really my only source of family and community at that time being homeschooled. So I would have a lot of fears of feeling like something bad would happen if I didn't flip a light switch four times or if I didn't close the blinds open and shut an even number of times. And it sounds really funny and really weird and like, how does that connect with that? Um, but it really did freak me out. I didn't know that if I didn't do that, that something bad wouldn't happen. I didn't know that it wasn't real. These obsessions and the other thoughts about suicide and suicidal ideation really, again, started to scare me. So I told my parents. They had built enough into my life that I felt comfortable coming to them, mostly my mom, not my dad, sorry, dad, um, but to sit with him and say, hey, like, this is what's going on. I'm really struggling and I don't know what to do. Um, they hugged me, they consoled me, told me how much they loved me, and then they stuck me in therapy. Uh, honestly, at the time, um, I'm, I'm glad they did looking back, but at the time, um, um, it really did suck uh, because as a child, you don't always understand how to use therapy, what it's there for, how, you know, how do you do this? And so I would just kind of talk about books I liked or, you know, movies I was watching and my therapist would try to keep bringing me back um, to the feelings that were under all of it. A lot of the time, my mom would actually be in the room with me just because I was so young and I didn't always know how to stay on topic and, and make goals and achieve them. Um, she, I gave my consent for her to be in the room for a majority of the sessions to also help her build her parenting skills and learn how to understand me in a different way. This therapist, who I ended up seeing for 10 years after that as well, <laughs> diagnosed me with generalized anxiety disorder, which we did mention today, um, which is a disorder where you're constantly worried about all kinds of stuff. Um, and it always kind of moves around to target different things. So once you're done worrying about one thing, it's just going to pop up and be something else. She also diagnosed me with obsessive compulsive disorder, which sounds very obvious looking back, but again, not a warning sign that I was really aware of. Being 12 and getting both of those diagnoses kind of right off the bat of life um, was more refreshing than it sounded because I felt like I was crazy. I didn't know what was going on. So to get a name to something like that actually gave me a, a way to know that there was treatment and that I could get help. I did leave therapy for a little while thinking I was all better because I don't think I really understood that mental illness is not something that is one and done. It is not something that you can get you know, cured of. There is recovery. You can be in periods of feeling better and feeling worse. Um, but I did end up going back to the same therapist when I was 16. Uh, I was in my very first relationship, as many of us are when we're 16. Um, but instead of having a, a normal attachment to this poor 16-year-old boy who put up with so much, um, I would sit on the phone with him every night sobbing my eyes out like I don't want you to leave me you know just very very scared and just feeling like constant paranoia and panic that he was gonna leave me or cheat on me or he didn't want me anymore and he was just lying every time he said he loved me obviously that's not normal I didn't know that wasn't normal but I cried loud enough that my parents heard and they were like that's not normal so they put me back into therapy um, and helped me to kind of work through those feelings um, ironically I did end up dumping him a couple years later but it did take a couple years. At 17, I went to college. Um, as I mentioned several times, I was homeschooled. I never went to school, not even in like pre-K. I never did that. And so going straight into full-time college away from home was quite the experience. Um, I was convinced that I was actually stupid, that my grades in I did through like a virtual academy meant nothing um, that I was going to fail out that I was going to be you know misery upon my family as the oldest and um, I felt like I just had to do good enough that was my goal so I joined the honors program I was on the dean's list and president's list every single semester I graduated with summa cum laude I had two majors and a minor um, and I never felt good enough um, through all of that, through all the internships, working constantly to make my own money, to make ends meet, um, I never felt like I was good enough. During all this work I was putting myself through, obviously I was really starting to struggle tangibly with my mental health in ways that 
even I could recognize as a warning sign. I would have panic attacks the night before every exam, especially math. Um, I would go into Spanish class, literally mascara running um, just to get the attendance um, because I just really wanted to prove myself. And it was at this point um, around 19, so I really suffered like that for two years. Um, at 19, I started to take medication for my anxiety. I was very, very scared of taking medication, which is why I held off for so long um, because we hear a lot of stigma, a lot of kind of not true statements out there that medications um, for mental health will change who you are, they'll make you a zombie. Um, and I didn't want that. You know, I wanted to maintain my friendships and my relationship. I wanted to feel like myself. Um, and I eventually, like once I found the right medication and the right process and procedure for me, um, I definitely started to feel better. I definitely had less panic attacks, less breakdowns, um, less crying sessions. Um, and it was still there, uh, but it definitely felt like it gave me a little room to breathe. That being said, um, I can never win, which is kind of the moral of my story. That sounds sad, but <laughs> I, later that year, I started getting really, really sick. Um, my anxiety had always kind of hurt my chest. A lot of us with mental health conditions know that that can manifest physically as well, um, but this was really different. Um, it was in my stomach, um, kind of my digestive system. Uh, I kind of chalked it up to anxiety. I was like, I don't need to go to a doctor for this. Um, it's gonna be fine. Um, but a couple years later, when I was 21, um, literally during the height of COVID, um, I had finally kind of gone through enough. I had dealt with this for long enough and I was starting to get the suspicion that maybe this wasn't just my mental health issues. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder called Crohn's disease. That kind of came out of nowhere. Um, and Crohn's disease, I didn't even know what that was when they told me that I had that. Um, it's a condition where your body starts attacking your entire digestive tract. So your stomach lining, your intestinal walls, really anywhere that the digestive system can get its hands on. Um, and it's attacking itself because it thinks there's something wrong, which is what an autoimmune disorder is. And a lot of times that can be triggered by stress. And in that time of very severe stress, um, it really brought the Crohn's disease from zero to 100. This was definitely the point in my life where I felt the most like giving up. Um, I had all these mental health labels and I was fine with them. But when it got to this one, this was the one that I wasn't sure if I was going to get through. Um, and with Crohn's, kind of one of the worst parts about it is that um, not only does it never go away, um, just like mental health conditions, um, but unlike mental health conditions, which I felt like I was kind of dealing with behind the scenes, Crohn's is something I un unfortunately have to go public about a lot because um, Crohn's really impacts what you can eat. And as you guys know, a lot of things we do socially um, in the workplace are centered around food. Um, name your favorite food, I probably can't eat it. Um, pizza, ice cream, coffee, soda, like every single thing that I was eating that was in my diet, I had to take out of my diet. Lettuce, spinach, Brussels sprouts. I love Brussels sprouts, like that's not fair. Um, but just a lot of things that were taken away from me. And there was a very, very big loss. When I started finding out about this and really unraveling what that meant for me and learning my new diet. I was sleeping constantly um, to set the scene. Again, this is during COVID. It was my senior year of college. Um, everything was on Zoom and I'm like the top high like achieving honor student and I was skipping classes. I was falling asleep during classes a lot of the time. Um, I started gaining weight definitely in response again to that new diet and that big change, um, but also like not moving a lot. I would just lay in bed all day um, and self-hatred and feelings of not being good enough were kind of bubbling back up to the surface. Um, I knew I loved the people around me, especially my, my partner who still stuck with me and he's still here today. Um, but those kind of things, I felt nothing to him and I didn't, you know, I felt sad and anxious and frustrated, but not loving and happy and, and nourished. That was my first experience with a major depressive disorder. Again, even as somebody who's gone through psychology and courses and, and knows all this, I didn't connect the dots. I just thought maybe this is Crohn's, maybe this is this, but um, those six months there were really, really tough to get through. I was diagnosed with the depression near the end of that episode and things were already starting to look up. I was getting used to that new diet and my new lifestyle and I was really starting to come to terms with um, what was going on internally and externally with my body. However, that being said, that weight gain that I mentioned really started to bother me um, and definitely more than it should have. I started counting calories religiously, panicking and feeling guilty or spitting out food when I felt like I'd eaten more than I should. And with Crohn's, you have to think about food 24 seven. You have to think about what's in your food. I can't 
cannop, onion, or garlic that's in everything. You have to look at menus before you go to restaurants, and it can be really, really stressful. Um, and so I was thinking about food much more than I ever had before. Um, I studied my reflection in every surface. I was body checking, um, you know, definitely fixating on parts of my body and, and in a very unhealthy way. And all of this led to me being diagnosed with another mental health condition, body dysmorphic disorder or body dysmorphia, which is something I'm still very actively struggling with. I was only diagnosed with it last year, um, so it's still very new. Um, and in the last few weeks, even after not weighing myself for over a year, I was so frustrated with this weight gain that I had perceived and that I felt I'd thrown away clothes that I thought I didn't fit in anymore, only to find out that I actually lost weight. Um, so it was literally that body dysmorphia and that delusion of weight gain was so strong um, that it made me think that I had done this. And I literally have thrown away clothes. Um, but with all that being said, obviously have a lot going on. I have a handful of mental health conditions that come and go, uh, always impacting my life and the lives of my loved ones as well in different ways. Um, and now I have Crohn's disease kind of impacting it and complicating it even more because like we mentioned at the very beginning, physical health and mental health um, really kind of coexist together and can impact each other. Sometimes it can feel like my body hates me. I can get really frustrated about that. Um, and it takes a lot of effort to get out of that negative headspace and to be honest with myself. However, that being said, I am in therapy. I'm taking my medication. I have a doctor for every single problem that I have. Um, and I have a support network of my family still. I can still go home and talk to my mom about what's going on and what I need, and my dad too, um, and my sisters, my friends, my boyfriend. Um, and I'm learning a lot along the way, um, most especially that I can't hate myself into health as hard as I might try, um, that it's okay for me to take up space in a therapist's office, in a support group, um, in a yoga studio, wherever you guys need to be, you're allowed to be there, you're allowed to take up space. Um, and even when I didn't have this many diagnoses, I was still valid and worthy of taking up space. Um, and self-care for me has been the biggest part of my recovery. Um, obviously, I can't stand here and say that I'm in recovery and everything's better and, and I'm great, um, but it goes, it comes and goes, it's, it's touch and go. But um, Self-care is the biggest part of my recovery, other than medication and therapy, that's really made a difference. Um, and I definitely recommend it to anybody. It's self-care is not selfish. Um, even doing simple things, like sometimes I find it really hard to get in the shower just with the body dysmorphia, but showering is really important and it makes you feel really good a lot of the time. So little things like that, just making sure you take care of yourself. Um, and even with all these diagnoses, that is not who I am. I am actually a person, believe it or not, underneath all of them. Um, and I'm still learning how to let myself come to the surface. With that being said, thank you guys so much for being here today, for listening to my story. Um, I'm one of the young adult presenters for Ending the Silence, so if you ever have your student attend one of our programs, maybe they'll hear my story too. Um, and just thank you so much. If you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat if you're here with us live. Um, but if you have any questions that you can't give to us right now in this moment, you can email info at naomicba.org. I'm the one who monitors that. You can also call us or visit our website um, for more information. Thank you guys so much.